Hey, good <laughs> afternoon. It's Mimi Kelly with Tasha Hardy, my new filmmaker friend. Say hey, Tasha. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to have your bio in the on the Facebook page where I'm going to put this. But just give us a little quick synopsis of who you are as a filmmaker. Sure. So I've been um, in the film industry for over 15 years. I started out as an AD in Hollywood. I now live in Austin. Um, and I've Wait, made. Stop, uh, stop, stop. Oh. I always get. Tell us a little bit about how you became an AD in Hollywood. Oh, sure. So um, I'm trying to think how it even started, but I, I grew up in Minnesota and there was one assistant director who sent in his resume for a short film that was shooting in Minnesota from LA because he wanted to move back to Minnesota and he was in the union. And I was like, why is this guy care about this little Minnesota thing? Um, so I connected with him and he said, look, you know, if you come here, I can get you uh, production assistant work and then you can work your way into the union. He was the only person I knew there and I moved out there just on a whim. Um, and he got me my first job on the movie Magnolia as a production assistant. And I oh, went wow. from there. Oh, wow. That was that was meant to be, right? Yeah. Divinely ordained. And how long were you in L.A.? I was in L.A. for 12 years. 12 years. And I missed you, but we met. We met. I know, I know. <laughs> yes, we did. We met at a film festival, so we were meant to meet. That I still can't pronounce, by the way. Is it Machau? Machu? I don't know. <laughs> I go back and forth too. I think it's Machal. Machal? Oh. Okay. Machu. Machu. That sounds more funny. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> they were on the picket line on Thursday, but I had been at Warner Brothers, and I was at Warner Brothers on Wednesday, so I didn't get to go to see them on Thursday. Which okay. It would have been nice to see them because that was a great festival. I so cool. enjoyed that festival. It was one of the best ones I've been to. I, it was so fun. It really was a lot of fun. And I'm going to spend some time, but I'm going to let you go back and give us your short bio. I know I interrupted that. But I want you to talk to us a little bit about film festivals and some of the best festivals you've been in once we get to curiosity. But let's go back. Give us a short clip of your bio as a filmmaker. Sure. So, um, okay. So I did start working my way up um, as a production assistant and non-union assistant director, but then I kind of discovered in the middle of it, a assistant directing does not lead to a creative position, which I didn't really know that I was just this naive young person from the Midwest um, when I moved to LA. And also um, I don't particularly love being on set. I don't like the culture of being on set. So I'm like, well, I still want to be in the industry, but I I only want to do it if I can do my own thing or produce for other people or, you know, start out not on a higher level, but I don't want to be like a worker bee. Right. So mm. um, I met, um, I can't remember his name, the person who started this, but I got involved with this digital Star Trek episode with George Takei that was, uh, it turned into a fan film, but it was supposed to be a pilot for George Takei to be, um, to be on tv and so we and he was like okay well you know pay me this and we'll do it and we'll try and pitch it and uh i started out a pa on that and then i the ad something happened he was sick or something so then i ended up ading and then i ended up raising money for it and they made me a producer so that was the first tv pilot that i ever produced um then i fell in love with tv pilots <laughs> and i was like this is where it is for me um produced mm. another one with um uh, Brian Cranston, who wasn't that famous at the time, he was still the dad in Malcolm in the Middle, and uh, a gentleman named Jim Troche, who is a pretty well-known quadriplegic actor at the time. He passed away about 10 years ago. And another comedy pilot. Um, then I decided I wanted to write and produce my own stuff. I spent about eight years writing and still doing short films and stuff, um, not not as a producer, more just, uh, you know, just, just kind of keep myself in the mix. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Fast forward to taught myself how to be a tech producer, produce animation, worked for National Geographic um, for a little while on a show and have been producing animation. And then my own film, I, this is the only, Curiosity was the first film of my own that I've written and produced last year. 
Okay. Now, Curiosity is the first of your pilot that you produce. Yes, I was going to ask you to do that. Of my own. Yeah, I've done okay. for other people, but not ever myself. Now, and I want to go back to something you said, because I have not spent a lot of time on set. Only on, I produced, wrote and produced and directed three short films. And then I did One Night in L.A. So I have not had time on other sets a lot of times. And so... Talk to me a little bit about why you decided that doing your own um, content was better than being a worker bee on the set. Um, I think, well, first of all, I didn't realize I was inter. I, I don't think, I think when I moved to LA, I didn't believe that I could ever be a screenwriter. I was like, I'll, I can't do that. Like, it's too hard and I'm not good enough. And then I worked on the movie Hollow Man. No offense to Hollow Man, because <laughs> I'm going to say something bad about it. Um, as a production assistant, before the internet was, you know, a big deal, we were running script pages back and forth from the writer's house to set, you know, like different, the colored pages or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when I got there one day, one time, one day to pick stuff up, the guy wasn't there. And he's like, you have to wait for me for 45 minutes. I'm like, okay. Um, and I had the old script and I, we were shooting out of order, obviously. And so it was, I, I never really got the concept of what it was. And then I read the script and I was like, this is terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, if this guy is getting paid like a million dollars to write this script, like I can learn how to write if any, if this guy can get this made, <laughs> it's like really bad, you know? And the movie like tanked terribly, even though it was really fun to work on. Um, Kevin Bacon was amazing, but that's what, that was my inspiration was a negative push of reading something and, and just mm. being like, it wasn't terrible, but just really just like, I was like, I could totally do this, you know? interesting um and working 17 hours a day five to six out five to six days a week i mean i just burned out after three years of that i just totally burned out yeah those were harsh 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 conditions and i wonder if in any of these strikes they dealt with the actual work day and the conditions of the work day or because that union was on strike way before any of the others right the Writers Guild? Uh, before the Writers Guild, like, it was last year when all the production people went on strike. Yeah, I say, yeah, I, kind of I wonder, that. I wonder if they, I think they did deal with changing the number of hours they could work, but I still think it's a lot. I think it's still like 14 hours or something that they can work. I'm not sure. Don't, um, I shouldn't be speaking to that because I really, I'm not sure. But um, that's okay. interesting. That's interesting. I've always thought too. Well, I came. I came to script writing in a really strange way. My first novel was Option by a Hollywood couple. He was an executive at Warner Brothers, and she was a writer. And so they optioned my first novel, and we spent all of this time partying and flying around. To their wow. different <laughs> houses and having fun. So in the, in the front door, you know? And so that's why it's been so hard for me because uh, I came in the front door with this couple that had all of this clout in Hollywood and, you know, they had agents at CAA. And so after that was not, um, it was option, but it was never bought because we were really way before our time for black content they just right. you know they weren't ready for it i remember one of the agents said well, we wouldn't have writers for this and i was like what we can't have writers for it because i think it was pretty um you know the integration diversity the calls for diversity and the increase of black writers number of black writers so um yeah my time creating has been quite interesting which um, leads me to my next question for you. You know, I wrote that piece about creative positive response, which is really about creatives just always finding the next creative outlet for their work or their expression or their right. voice. And it sounds like you're you're expert at doing that. Do you feel that? Do you feel fulfilled in all the different things you've done in between deciding I mean, I'm going to write a script and writing curiosity? 
Oh, you're saying like you're saying like the next thing I have going, or do, you're just saying everything? I'm saying just overall in general. Do you feel satisfied as a creative in terms of the different things that you've had to do, other than just write and produce your own work? I I do I do yes, and I and I I've come to realize that. The kind of stuff for my own stuff the what fulfills me is writing kind of weird weird stuff like I, I didn't realize curiosity was so weird until i i see the way it's programmed at film festivals and they're like the absurd comedy block and i'm like oh i guess it's kind of weird you know but i write kind of weird, weird. stuff but <laughs> it's, it's okay weird. i've always been like the you know sort of like the outlier <laughs> but whatever weird though right now what question i did have you about curiosity because is he supposed to, he's autistic, correct? Well, he's on a little bit on the spectrum and it's it's based off of a guy, my stepdad, um, okay. my mom around anymore. And my stepdad is a little bit on the spectrum and it's not supposed to be like about a guy who's autistic, but there's just a sense, especially in the TV show that we're pitching that he's a little bit like on the spectrum. Like he's just a little bit out of, he's not totally quite in the reality that we are in. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And so that was my question for you. I totally got it. You know, I have an autistic son. My oldest is autistic. So I look for content. I fall in love with content that, you know, has characters that are quirky and don't fit in any particular box. So I was, I loved it right away. And, and that's funny that film festivals put it in these different, but that's because they're just trying to, Come up with a program that makes sense, you know. For you're freezing up a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's okay. No, I, it's not offensive or anything. I just, I just, I can see it's a little bit more different than I thought it was. But I'm like, it's okay. Whatever, it's working. So. <laughs> okay. So tell us about curiosity. Tell us about um, your the inspiration behind it, and when you decided you just had to do it, and talk yeah. to us about it. So I um I wrote it quite a long time ago. I wrote it like six years ago. Rewrote, 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 wrote a pilot, wrote in everything. Didn't write a short film. Um, but I was like, uh, I think I was talking to a producer. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a, a producer friend of mine who was like, you should write a short and do a short as a TV proof of concept. I was like, I don't have the money for that and all this stuff. And so, but I I ended up writing the short flatly, you know, after the pilot. Um, and then I thought maybe I'll just email Bob Clendenin who looks just like my stepdad and my stepdad is the inspiration for the he, my stepdad is a was a mailman and he uh oh you froze bumble around this little town called Adrian but um oh yeah did I freeze that's okay keep going I think okay so they he, he's like in his 60s and his friend Jared is much younger um and they kind of bumble around was like well what if they just kind of got in people's business you know and and jared is is a cop he wants to be a cop but he's just got all these like problems in his life that keep him from going to police academy um but he, he wants to be a cop and i was like well what if you know what if bob's character was you know constantly getting into the neighbor's business and he was teaming up with his, his younger friend um and they were getting into trouble and that's where the whole thing kind of started and I went to bobclendenin.com. His email address was up there. I asked him if he wanted to be in it. And he said, yes. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, what? I go, all right. You know, I mean, I have, I'd have a background of doing, you know, I have a pretty good way, I think, of pitching myself. But I was pretty surprised that he was like, all right. And then I went to John Lear, who's his best friend, who I didn't know. And I emailed him and I said, Bob said he'd be in this. Do you want to be a producer? And he said, okay. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it just it was like it this never happens like this you know it was it became right. a snowbally magic thing and then I got so jacked up I was like I'm just gonna crowdfund I can't I can't take having all these people it was during COVID so everyone mm. was like yeah whoops we have time to do it now right um, all in it you know very rare to my personality I I worked with her, but we w were not getting along on the vision and she was stalling about, she kept saying she was going to find the money and then she did, never did it. And it was just, it was a Hollywood BS that we were talking about before, you know, just people full of, 
it. <laughs> That's the only way I can say it. I was like, I can't do this anymore, you know? And so uh, John introduced me to James Sunshine because James had directed John's last feature and it all just started happening. Then I crowdfunded, um, even though I don't know if I could ever put myself through that again. It was three months of night and day, but it worked. Um, I found a, a super fan of Bob Clendenin who gave me a, quite a bit of the budget, who ended up being an executive producer. And then we shot it during COVID and I, I was not in LA most of the time. I only came in for the shoot because of COVID and I just produced it like from here. Mm. Basically, I set everything up from here and then I just came in and shot it and left. Wow. That's exciting. That's amazing. And that just, that just shows, you know, the ups and downs of this journey and crowdfunding and producing virtually um, and although all my players were in LA, it still felt like most of it was virtual because I'm in San Fernando Valley. And I think the, my, my young producer that I was working with, he was, you know, on the outskirts, uh, in the inland Valley. And so it just wasn't convenient for us to sit at a coffee house together. So we did most of our planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in Zoom and on the phone. So that's yeah. just the way of the world now. That is so interesting. And so you filmed it during COVID. Do you, uh, you know, you asked me, what was your budget? And I was like, I don't talk about budgets, but <laughs> you tell details of the production, like the budget and how long it Oh, took. yeah. I'm just, I have a big mouth and I don't know if it's like, it probably works against me, but the whole thing was $20,000 and I probably spent, okay, I'll say 25 because of all the film festivals. I didn't, I didn't think we were going to get into that many. So, I, or I had the time to travel. And so I, I raised, I raised about, let me think, I have to think about this, 15 or 16. And then I put in another, I put in 10 myself for just all this other music optioning stuff that happened, or not optioning, music licensing stuff and traveling around to film festivals. It turned out the, the marketing was almost as much as the shooting of the thing. Yeah. Um, as far as like going to all the festivals and stuff, which has been totally worth it. Like I said, I got, I mean, the job I'm about to, I, I'm a contractor. I just signed another year of contract, but the job I have now is because of that film for many, many reasons. It, it literally changed my life. Mm. So. Now, how many festivals has it been in? Uh, we're at n number 19. You've been in 19 festivals and it was completed. What is the completion date of it? Um, we premiered at LA Shorts last year um 2022 on july 23rd and one thing i did that i will never do again because i was delusional is it was actually <laughs> completed five months before that but i was like i'm gonna submit to sundance in berlin and i'm gonna wait to, to submit to any other festivals to see mm -hmm. if i get into the big ones which of course i'll get into and you know how this is right and then we didn't get in so i wasted right. like five months in this like fantasy la la land mm, unfortunately all, yeah all go through. so don't do that other filmmaker well now this is the thing you are my i mean a lot of it's politics too but at the same time i'm learning from you with film festivals because i completed one night in la i had no intention to be on the film festival circuit i just didn't and luckily it all worked like i in my mind, said it would work until the damn strike. Right, right. I just, I just didn't... think it's putting it on hold, though. Like, I don't think you've lost any track. I mean, everyone's kind of like, it's not like it's at, it's not like it's just one thing that happened that was negative about the film. And it's, it's, it's like just the, the landscape changed temp. Saying, I really do. Yeah. But I think, you know, had I had that film festival circuit plan, I would have kept publicizing it, you know, so I feel like I've just sort of set it aside and gave it to that agent and just put all my cards with the agent and the producer that are representing. 
I don't know. If I had an agent, I would like, I'd forget about mine too. Like I'm so exhausted from promoting. Like I, I do the same thing. I'd be like, I hate this film. I've seen it so many times. Just somebody else just deal with it for a few months. But the only problem is if they're not dealing with it, then, then they're, it's just True. sitting there, you know? That's right. Like, yeah. When it's in a festival, do you go see it every single time? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know. Oh. But um, those are fun. It's fun to get the audience reaction. Oh, totally. Yeah. Especially the, the one we were at was like the best audience reaction I've ever gotten. Like literally people laughed at all the parts that I wanted them to laugh at. And I was mm. like, wow, that was like, that was a really the, the best. And Cause some people it's just silence the whole time. And I'm like, eh. or mm -hmm. somebody will start laughing. Like my favorite is every once in a while I'll do a festival and it'll be total, you know, people kind of laugh. Ha ha ha. And there's always someone who just starts cracking up hilariously when and it's Bob, not when they're supposed to. No, like Bob's doing the monologue about the burn guy in the burn unit at the hospital, and it's all this sadness, and somebody bursts out hysterically laughing the whole time. Every I'm just like, why is that funny? It's not funny. <laughs> are, you like, are you like me? Do you sit in the back row of the theater so you could see it, the backs of everybody's heads and how they're moving? Um, I it just depends, I guess. I. I think that's a good idea, though. Yeah, I, I pretty much sit in the back. I would. I don't sit in the front, I'll tell you that. But yeah, no, I can kind of see. Yeah, yeah. I, I sit in the back. And what in LA is a strange movie? Look, man, love your comment, which I'm just running with, that it's a love poem. And because I wrote it as a play, I literally did play with every single word. I can remember sitting in a room for... I'm ashamed to say how long I sat in the room, but a long time. And I played with every single word. So uh, when you said that, I was like, yes, you got it. That's it. It's really like this play of words. And and that's why I tell people that they should have a cocktail and that they should be able to watch it all the way through. <laughs> I just, it's so, you're gonna, hopefully you're not offended by this because I mean no. this in like this wonderful way is that I saw the Barbie movie last night. Did you see the Barbie movie? yes okay you know the the dialogue how it's like really deep and some of it's really psychologically deep it, for some reason i thought of your movie when i saw that i was like <laughs> and i'm like she's gonna freaking kill me as i compare her dialogue to the barbie movie <laughs> like, oh no you're gone i can't hear you no more oh no no can you no hear me now can you hear yeah, me? Yeah. Okay. yeah yeah I loved Barbie. <laughs> okay, so we were supposed to go out of town. We didn't because I was sick. And my my husband and my son are at uh, the Equalizer, which I realized when I was signing on, it's a big damn deal because my husband has not been to the movie since 2019. He has, not, other than when he went to screenings with me, and he loves to go see a good and Denzel Washington movie. So, um, and so I was thinking, maybe I'll watch Barbie while they're gone. Because I loved Barbie. Yeah, me too. So I, I, I take that as a compliment. I really Okay, did. good. Okay. Yeah, but, I mean, yours is actually, I mean, your dialogue is, is even more so that way. But there was, there was certain lines in that movie. I was like, oh, the dialogue is kind of reminding me, like that really deep, like, meaning I can't there's a word for it but it's it's like it just was like really I was like wow it reminds me of Mimi's movie it's deep you know I mean it has all of these under underlying meanings and tones that you really huh. just have to pay attention to to get and that's why it brought out such strong emotions on some people like that Bill Maher I mean he just went bananas over Barbie you know um because he Obviously, oh, picked up really? on, yeah, he was just bashing and it was like, okay, so you got all of it, didn't you? He oh, was, he was, he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He was bashing it. Uh -oh. what, what, did, what did he say? What did he say? Oh, can you hear me? What did he yeah. say? I pay attention to him because I don't pay attention to him a lot, but he was just saying, you know, it was male bashing and it was horrible. He just really talked about it badly. Interesting. Yeah. I thought it was the opposite. I thought it, it kind of commented on like male female equality. You know what I mean? Mm. I think it was kind of well balanced out the other way a little bit, you know, that she was so 
she's like they're like where does where do where do the ken sleep and she's like i don't know like <laughs> she's like that it's like he got pissed off that barbie land was i mean obviously it was that it became that you know uh where he was a bad person but i think it kind of it kind of balanced out for me now tell me this curiosity is how many minutes it was 15 minutes 14 minutes it was 14 minutes um and yeah we keep freezing the internet is not cooperating talk to me about you directed it correct no i did not actually uh a friend of john lear's directed it his name is james sunshine okay so you didn't direct it you just but you were on the set as they were filming it yeah i was i produced it and i i Okay, say the last part. It froze on my, your last no, part. No, that's okay. Um, I produced it like I was like the line producer on set. Um, and then I, I obviously wrote it too, but no, I didn't direct it. Okay, okay. So did she, did the director pretty much um, follow your blueprint? I know sometimes directors will have their own take on a story and sort of. Well, he actually helped me. I was having, I was struggling while I was writing the short and he helped me, helped me with a vision of, of the short, like the last pass of it. But he actually made it darker than it was. It was kind of a kooky mm. comedy before, but he was like, what if we made it kind of dark? And I was like, okay. So that whole darkness tone of it, that was all him. So he, he, he made it, he enhanced it. It was better when he mm. came on. Interesting. I'm sweating up a storm for some reason. <laughs> my, my glasses keep fogging up. You know, I need to drink more water. I'm just like, I'm this heat ball. <laughs> just, uh, I'm emanating heat. So, um, but that's interesting. I, you know, the work that I want to film upcoming movie which is a sequel to one night in la i'm so close to it i don't know if i could let somebody else direct it but i probably should try this might be a good time for me to let some directors read the script before i make a final decision to direct because directing is a pain in the butt man it is um but i don't know if you you know, my mind was really organic and the actors were just, they really got the vision. So I gave them a yeah. lot of leave. Yeah. Lots of leave. Well, me too. I mean, they were improv like 25% of the time. I just let them go. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, the first director, like I said, was a problem. And then I was like, maybe I should direct. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even think that way. Like, I just want to write and produce. And then I, I got really lucky with James Sunshine. So, um, I wouldn't never direct, but I'm, it's just I, it's just too much stuff at once, you know. I can't even imagine trying to do that while producing and then trying to write at the same time. It's like a lot of stuff. Yes, well, and and my directing is I do it all in the pre production. I mean, I literally like think of every single thing that right. in terms of you know, is it a boy or a girl? It's a girl. She's driving me crazy <laughs> What's her, name? Uh, her name is zelda she's 10 years old she's zelda. a little Hi, yeah. zelda. she's really cute she's adorable <laughs> um so i put all of my and, and everybody gets upset because they're like why are you writing all this in the script i'm writing it in the script because i don't want to have to tell you when we get on set I want you to already know my vision you know and so I put a lot in the script. Um, I give them a playlist, a music playlist, because the music is really big for me. And so, um, and most times, and then we talk about it. And I mean, I think when they're really good actors, like my guys are really good actors. Yeah, they I were. Just, they're really good. That's one thing no. I know. They were amazing. And they came out of theater in New York. And so that's why they just got it and they ran with it. And so directing wasn't, you know, I had more issues directing the um, 
support production staff than the actors. The actors okay. creatively, we were on the same page and we were vibing and we were getting it. But it was all those other people that we had to, you know, keep from um, spoiling our vibe. <laughs> spoiling it. <laughs> so, so, okay, so 19 festivals. That's amazing. 19 festivals in just a little over a year. And what's next for it? What's next for Curiosity? We have about four months left on the, I think, on the film festival circuit. Um, we have, we're have we waiting to hear back from eight more, and then I, I just have stopped submitting. And um, once the strike's over, we'll continue to pitch as a TV series forever. And I guess I'll find distribution for it. I don't know anything about short film distribution. Maybe you do. I have no clue as to how, I mean, I probably can't really make money off it. I don't know. I'd love to put it. I'd love to put it on YouTube and figure out how to promote it so people, a lot of people see it more so mm. than making money off of it, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not now, sure. Some, some of the streamers have short film programming now. I think Showtime. I'm not sure of all of them, really? but some of oh, them nice. do. I know some of the black streamers definitely have sh short film programming and they will pay you a lump sum for the short film. That's um, cool. Yeah. So, you know, there are those kind of opportunities. But uh, <laughs> in terms of the pilot, how much of the production planning have you done for the pilot? Do you have a Bible? Do talk to me about where, where the pilot goes. Oh, yeah. So for all of it. So, okay. So I have a pilot. I have a Bible. I have a um like a pitch deck for the show but interestingly enough and i i i haven't done this yet because i've been asked for the pilot the both, both times i pitched it to production companies john lear said and this is interesting advice he said don't show them the pilot because if it gets picked so pitch it pitch deck in person whatever show them the short but if it gets picked up they're gonna pay you to write the pilot and then you'll already have it. It's better if you just hold off and pitch it, pitch your ideas, you know, mm. then when they ask you to write it, you already have it. And then they, they're paying you to write it, you know, so they don't have a preconceived notion of like what it actually is. You just, you, you say it how you want it. And then they come back and say, well, I'll do this, do that. Then you have something to go off of and they're basically buying the pilot you've already written. But every time they've asked for the pilot, I'm like, I'm not going to say, oh, there isn't one when there is. I just don't have the courage to say it doesn't exist yet. Because <laughs> I wrote it so many times. I'm like, I just can't say it doesn't exist. Like, I don't care. For similar advice, to not give the actual script. Right. To, and But I don't think it was for the same reason. I think they said, because Ben... They see that you're so locked into a particular vision, and if they want, yeah, to, that too. That was another. Yeah, if they want to give you feedback or change it, then they're more hesitant um, because you've already put it on paper. But you know, pay me, yeah. and I become very flexible when there's money coming into my account. <laughs> Yeah, I used to be all locked into it too. And I'm like, man, I don't care if you pay me enough. Like if it's about a giraffe and a duck that live on an island at this point, like I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is the only way I can get it made. Like I wanted to get it made my way, but if there's only one way and it's weird, I'll just do it. <laughs> exactly. I remember with that first option, I was just, I was fighting, I was holding on. If, yeah. they, would, if they would only see me now. <laughs> it's like, Oh, you want her to be white? Oh, <laughs> that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a good, uh, <laughs> not good advice for black programming. You want her to be white? <laughs> not a good thing. <laughs> but I got a sense of humor. You got to have a sense of humor with this, right? Yeah. My husband, whenever I get down on it, my husband's like, "But you got to remember, you chose this." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No one put a gun to your head and said, Mimi, start writing scripts and then go to Hollywood and see if you could sell them. You chose to do this. So, 
feels like we have to though like I feel like if I don't do it I feel like I'm gonna go freaking nuts you know even just like a week of not doing something creative I get sick to my stomach it's like it's irritating it like kind of runs me you know that's true that's interesting that's interesting because I have the same you know I've been running from creative for the last 30 years I mean I'm I literally wake up going god what else can I do (laughs) (laughs) I just I run from it and you know just this morning I recommitted to like writing just writing anything an hour a day oh that's great yeah because I think that's where my my greatest creativity is when I just do it without an agenda and really no plans to share it with anybody and then something a great jewel will come out of it and I'll know okay that that has to be completed that has to be shared and so right now I'm living on fumes that's when it it... I'm living on fumes of stuff I've already written what about you do you have any anything new that you just have to write or that you just have to produce oh yeah so, curiosity tell us about that um so i i've written quite well i've written quite a few features and shorts but i would say there's there's about wait love you so much my dear enemy there's there's four one tv pilot two shorts and two features that are really really ready and i've decided and this is like a little pain what? for me because I have the same thing, which I've stopped writing because I've written so much stuff by myself and my writing partner that I'm like, no, 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 I've got to stop writing and make the stuff. And that's what I, that's why I did curiosity. Now I'm doing another short I'm raising money for, I'm in the process of just starting to raise money for another proof of concept for a TV and, series. And that's, that's going to be a proof of concept of the TV pilot that you've already written. Yeah. And it's a, it's a drama. So I, I wanted to do, I, what I don't want to do is 1,000 short films forever. What I want to do is curiosity, that's the comedy, then a drama, and then a, maybe I might do a play. We, we might turn a, a feature that we've done into a play, my writing partner and I, and then I have a feature film. It's like my dream film that I'm, I've been trying to get made for years, and it's with, a, it's with James Sunshine. He's trying to figure out how to make it less money so we can actually get it made, but that, that's the thing though, is I love writing, but I've written I've written enough where I, I need to be a producer now, but then I miss the writing and I don't have time to do both, you know? So I'm like, eh, whatever, you know, at least I have stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, I say an hour a day. I'm going to cut that in half. I'm going to commit to 30 minutes a day. You could do 30 minutes a day. And that way... Yeah you still are writing something and you just don't know what great jewels are going to come out of it. Right. I I have enough stuff to produce to last me until retirement that I've already written. So. Yeah, me too. That's why I'm like, uh, like, but, but you're right. It's like, you know, stopping completely stopping one thing is not really like, and then plus you kind of lose your, if you stop writing, you kind of lose the the mojo to like, your brain stops like growing, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> in that way. So the joy is really in just the creative process and being creative and feeling like you can just write for 30 minutes and create something special. Yeah. And you and you it's a surprise. You don't know where it's coming from. You know, it's deep in your subconscious. I love that process. So I think we have to continue with it. Yeah, you inspired me. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. And I, I, I know it sounds crazy. I don't think I can even do 30 minutes a day. I'm working like 10 hours a day, but I can do 15 minutes. And my See? writing part, my writing partner is like, she works like 140 hours a week, and she does 10 minutes a day. See, she writes See? one page a day, but then at the end of four months, guess what? She has a whole feature film. See? 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 <laughs> there you go. There you go. So 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Now yeah. tell me about this writing party partner i'm jealous i didn't even know you had a writing partner I'm i do jealous. we don't always write together okay. um we we met 15 years ago in a in a ucla extension class and okay. um, there was 14 people in the class when we started and the teacher was so mean that everyone quit except me and her and one other guy oh my god <laughs> why was the teacher so mean oh, i don't know he was just so 
mean and we really? kind of felt like we went through something together you know yes. um well, he would like yell, yell at us about feedback I mean, it, was, it was it was like an act you know, look was, i want to hear about his this teacher that might be a great movie yeah i so mean um i can't remember his name but i just remember that he wrote this film that didn't it, it was like a long time ago it didn't do very well but um and I, I knew the director. The director was like a, this insane guy. Mm. But those two worked together. And then and then like 10 years later, he was trying to be on a TV show and he got kicked off because he was like too aggressive or something. And somehow he got hired to be a teacher. I don't know, whatever. But I, that's how I met Keiko. Um, and she had written this Alice in Wonderland script and wanted you know to rewrite it. And we just started writing together. We haven't done well though writing feature we've written a few features and for some reason they don't we just can't seem to get it together with it so we've now decided we wrote the short the next short is her and i wrote that together and then we did write a feature we're going to make into a play but um we've had trouble writing together not not conflict just just we're writing trying to write fantasy i don't think i just don't think i'm good at writing fantasy um so it's Mm. been it's just it's been like a good exercise right so you, you learn what you you know, you're even if you write a feature or something that doesn't work out, it, it's still you're still it's like an exercise in writing. You're still getting better, right? But um, right. I give it I, the fantasy stuff. I'm just I'm over it. I'm like I can't take this anymore. I can't build a world mm. without losing myself in the world so much. I lose the story and then I lose the characters and I can't. I mean, it just I can't. I I think I need to. I would have to take a class, like a really long series of classes, <laughs> if I wanted and, to do that. Yes. <laughs> And that led me to a question I was going to ask you. When you're writing your stories, what's more important to you, plot or character? Which one drives you the most, do you think? Oh, the characters. The characters. And usually I'll meet someone and Mm -hmm. it'll start to go like my brain will start to wrap around their, you know, and I get like, what if they were like this and what if that and or or relationship. It's usually... It probably sounds odd coming from a, a girl, but like usually it's two guys. I like buddy stuff, but I, I, I love writing about men's relationships with each other. I have no idea why. And that's the curiosity thing that came from that. Um, or, or just buddies in general, like two friends and their relationship with each other. And like, if it's interesting enough, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, how did they bond? And so. Mm, that's interesting. Well, I, as you could tell, probably for one night in a way, I'm all about the character. I just fall in love with these characters and I can't let them go. I mean, I literally can't let them go. Right. I mean, One Night in LA has been a play, it's a pilot, and it's a feature, okay? I probably would write it as a book, but I'm just, I'm not going to do it as a book. You're so sick of it. Like, did, I, did you ever, did you produce the play? No. Okay, okay. No, I did not. Although I did have a screening where we did some live um, improv. And one of the ladies that was there who was married to this really big producer in Hollywood said, I love it as a play more than as a, as a short. Because I have, I had my, the two shorts are the same characters. That's what I'm saying. I'm obsessed. I get obsessed with these characters and it's really hard for me to let go. And so that's why I produced it one night in LA because I thought if I never get to have its sequel, which is really what I wanted, the sequel is the big movie with the bells and whistles. I thought if I never got to have that and I had to just be satisfied with this character and walk away from her, what could I do? And that's when I said, I could do one night of her in a way. Interesting. Yeah. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. I thought <laughs> all of my characters, because I have all these other stories, I'll do one night of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way though. I, I literally like, like uh, we wrote a, Keiko and I wrote a war film um, about these, well, this is the one that might be a play. And it, there's a movie like this years and years ago. It was very different, but it's about this Japanese soldier and this American soldier who get stuck on an island together and they have to survive and they become friends. Um, 
You're and going, your camera is like going down. I can only oh. see. Okay, there you go. Sorry. There you are. Yeah. You, were, you, were, you were sinking into the universe. <laughs> Sorry. I think, this, I think the little hinge thing is going, is going bye-bye. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, we, we wrote this war film and we were having trouble with the characters. And I remember thinking when I was writing and I'm like, what if I was the, the American soldier and she was the Japanese soldier. And so she wrote it. I wrote her, her like her. And she wrote like me, like me. And then we go back and forth. And I literally like, was like, I felt like I was there, you know, mm -hmm. and I, like I was talking to her, you know, mm -hmm. it was, it was crazy. And I got like really emotional when I remember I wrote the last page and I was like crying. I'm like, I can't let him do it. Cause I felt like I was like, I was all screwed up in the head, you know, <laughs> cause I had imagined that it was us on this Island. And I'm like, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like you start getting kind of like goofy with stuff like oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and with one night in LA, like I said, I spent so much time in this room, just like right over there. I literally just locked myself in the room. And I can remember too having these teary afternoons where I was just like, oh, oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> like, oh. You know, I, and I, there are parts where she's writing to her sons, right? Right. So you know, I was writing to my son. Yeah, exactly. And I was really teary-eyed on those parts. Of course, yeah. No, it's like, it's, it, I it's a really whole thing. I was really teary-eyed on those parts. I'm just, being a creative, it's just a little crazy, you know. Yes, uh, it's a little crazy. It, it is a little crazy. We have to be. We, well, and we have to fall in love with it, or we wouldn't, you know, continue to pursue it and do 19 doggone festivals. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow, that's major. And how many were you like? Did you win any awards in any of them? Uh, uh we we won like best short like four times, and then we were nominated for nine awards. And then the the, the two coming up were nominated. It's a one one a one day Austin festival. We're actually nominated for five awards, which I'm like Jesus. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, but it's it, I'm excited because it's like the editors are nominated and the directors nominated. Like I oh. want other people, I want other people in it to win stuff, not just like best overall. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited yes. about that. And then Cincinnati, I'm going to in three weeks. We are nominated for best comedy short, and that's a really good festival too. So, um, for some reason, the last six months, people have taken to the film more than they did the first six months, and I don't know if it's the state of the world, but I, we've gotten better action in the last six months. I don't know why. I, I'm not Interesting. sure. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's great that you have a comedy. I really want to write a comedy. Because I do have a real comedic side. Um, did you see any of that in One Night in LA? Did you feel any comedy? Because I felt like I was trying to be funny, but... There were moments, yeah. I, I'd have to go back and look at it just to, like, you know what I'm saying, like, to get the overall, but there were definitely moments. Yeah. That, like, smart comedy moments that were, like, that just were, like, natural in the moment of the dialogue, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. I do like that. I love that. And I enjoyed that with yours. But it's funny when you tell me that you got this input from this director that gave you this dark insight, because I think something like that, where I was a little surprised. I was like, oh, it's going here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like that before. It was very like kooky, like uh, my name is Earl type of thing the dark side i wish i could you know that and i've always thought would be interesting if you could film something with the two different versions and let the oh. audience pick which one they like i always yeah. thought i always thought about doing something like that. that's a really good idea. that's actually a really good idea i know like i was gonna <laughs> i was i was gonna kill crystal at the end and just see you know and that way i could have the part where i killed her and then i could walk away from it that's the thing. you can you could do that though so while you're on set you'd have them do it one way and then you'd have them do it the, i mean they they might kill you because they might be like so emotionally traumatized by going back and forth but right. if you could if you could figure out how to do that you could just do it at the same time you just do different takes you know yeah and i think the next thing i film i will do that i want to have two different takes and i want to see what the audience and then That's let the idea. audience decide which one is the best that is a good awesome. idea That's fun. Um, it is, yeah. So, so, 
we talked a little bit. We're going to have to wrap it up because I don't want it to be too long. Um, but share with me what's next for you. Where exactly do you know what's next? Well, you already told me you're going to do the short film proof of concept for your pilot. What is that pilot called and what's it about? Can you tell us? Yeah, yeah. It's called I Love You So Much. And it's um, it's totally silent. And all the actors are deaf except one person. Um, it's about. Falls in love with this customer in the cafe she, she works at. And he, he becomes well, he is like very depressed. And she so she finds a unique way to make a difference in his life. And in return, he helps her get her hearing back all in 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And it's silent. It's, now, it's totally silent. That's all silent. In- now, where did that come from? Where did the inspiration for that come from? Um, I, well, well, first of all, one of my best friends, Michelle Schaefer, who's an actress is deaf. Okay. But, but really where, where it started was there's a cafe in Austin, a deaf cafe where all of the people that work there are deaf. Um, it's a crepe cafe. And I, you know, I've gone there a million times and it, the food is amazing and it's just really interesting. And I was like, this is so interesting. Like there's just gotta be a story here. And then I thought, well, what if it was about someone who worked here? And then it just starts this whole thing, you know? Interesting. And the cafe is in Austin? Yeah, I don't know if they'll let me shoot there or not. Apparently the mm. owners are difficult, I've heard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um but really, I mean that that's something I'm I'm raising money for, but also the place that I work, we're doing um a digital series. We are we've done all the ide- ideation, we're pitching it to our executives to get money to do a digital series on uh generative ai and data and it's all around uh artificial intelligence and that actually could be like on nat geo I and mean, we've thought about um pitching that as a tv series as a company so that that's now become part of my entertainment life because it's very related to mm, i'm just that's... not my heart isn't in it as much you know but it's still really it's pretty cool stuff mm-hmm. interesting and then the feature that you're thinking about doing as a play Tell me the name of that and what it's about. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's my dear enemy and the play part of it. So there's all this stuff that happens with the kamikaze plane sh- crashing and cr- stuff that you could never do in a play, but there's a whole section of it. That's about this Japanese and American soldier who are on this Island surviving together that could be contained in a play like format. And so we're rewriting it as a play, but o- they're only on the Island now. So it would be mm. really to make make it. It's it's very expensive the feature, and we're thinking, well, if we can if we can make it as a play. Yes. And over my head already just saying that, but uh, <laughs> seems really it seems easier than a movie. But for some reason, I have a feeling that's actually not true. <laughs> plays you know. are plays are. You know, I I want to get back in the theater, and. I've been, it's been coming to me a lot. I can really see one night in LA in the theater. Yeah, I can um, see, I can totally see it, yeah. Yeah, and so I hope to get a chance to do that. So, um, but that sounds like a good plan to just do the crash part and being on the island and do it as a play. That's, yep. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get ready to close up and I, to close up, I just want you to talk to me about um, what's your most enjoyable part about being a creative and what's the part you hate the most about this journey? <laughs> um, the most, imp- the most enjoyable part I like, I love collaborating with, with um, people that are on the same wavelength as uh, the collaboration part is like my favorite part. I would say, my least favorite part and probably a lot of creatives, I hate raising money, but I know you, I mean, obviously we have to do this. I don't like that part of it, but I don't think oh, anyone does. So I know, I know. Why can't we just figure out a way to pay for this stuff? Dear God, just let the Dear money God. drop down. <laughs> I know, just let me drop down. Because I'm now, you know, thinking about, I've done all my interviews for my documentary and it turned out to be a lot more simple than I ever imagined and I could make it more complicated but I think I'm going to stop and um, which means it's time to think about the actual putting it all together and producing it and because the writers are on strike 
I haven't written a script. I'm just talking to the editor and telling him how I want it. And he's going to give me a first draft. Isn't that interesting? Oh, wow. I mean, we're literally talking our way through. it. That is interesting. I love that. That's great. Yeah. And because it's such a personal story, it's easy for me to do that. Yeah. I Um, understand that. My mom is, is at the center of it. So it's easy for me to talk my way through it. But um, I think I'm going to have to raise some money. Oh, God, help me. (laughs) (laughs) You can crowdfund. It does work, but I'm telling you, it is hard to ask people for money all day. It is not. I I crowdfunded for for One Night in L.A. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I did. But I didn't. I started. What I did, I started with a coach in January. And then the actual campaign went up in April. So we had this lead time where she could tell me how to do everything. And then I put it up in April and we closed it in May. And I shot it at the end of July. So awesome. Yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was an interesting process. I loved it. Uh, I do like the fact that you can, take control of the process. And so that's what we have to think about when we have to raise money. That yeah. it's a blessing to be able to take control of the process. Yes, and, totally. And get what you need and film what you need to film and be done with it. I mean, what a blessing that is. That we're able to do that. And because of the technology now, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg, you know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's also psychology too. Like your, your story in your head of what asking for money is. I realize that too. It's like, it doesn't mean anything. People really want to contribute. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like you're begging or it's, it's, you have to kind of change your mindset too. Yes. And I think it will be different this time because we've gone through one fundraiser and we came out with great products. Yeah. A great piece. And so when we come back, they'll know we're real people. Yeah, it is scary the first time, but now it's not. It's like that that story, well, not story, but that experiment they did with with uh with mice. They put mice in water and see how long they could swim for. And they only they were like fifteen minutes, and they started to give up, and they took them out of the water. And then when they put them back in again, the mice swam for two and a half days because they knew, knew they knew they'd been saved the first time <laughs> that they were going to get saved again and i was like oh my god <laughs> hmm, that's that interesting, interesting. Yeah. yeah that is interesting what are your before i get off and it, of course i want to give you an opportunity to say anything about your work that you would like but also what are your thoughts about the strike any thoughts at all um i think i think uh, the reason that I left Hollywood was because I didn't enjoy the culture and I thought it was in in some ways corrupt. Not, not I me, mean, obviously not. There's a great side of it too, but I just feel like all of the bad, the bad energy part of it has come to a head. And I think, I almost think like all of the, I hope that all of the, the disconnectedness and everything that's happening turns into opportunities for people like us. And obviously people that are also in the unions themselves, but I feel like it kind of needs to get, the worst it can get before it can like rebuild. You know what I mean? Yeah. I sort of feel that way too. And I'm sitting right in the middle of it. Yeah, okay, right, right. But but and that very thought that you just expressed leaves me with about this much hope. I don't know. <laughs> there's yeah, there's a part of me that's excited about it. I'm like, oh finally all of it's going down. And now maybe out of this something wonderful will grow. But then I'm like or not, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> or nothing will happen and it just goes back to the way it was before. I have no idea. Yeah, there's a lot of stink to clear out. And I don't think there's enough brave people to make it happen. True that. Uh, you can see that. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I'm not there, so I'm just making all the, I, I can't remember a lot of things from Hollywood. Like, I've, I mean, I go back and forth, but I can't yeah. remember a lot. But, yeah. Yeah. So... Here we sit. Um, so anything you want to share before we call it a day? I have enjoyed this. I'm going to keep having conversations. 
because talking to others about their creative journeys is very inspiring for me. Oh, me too. Yeah. No, I love talking with you. Like you, like very rarely do I even meet other filmmakers at film festivals who I I'll connect for a little while and they kind of fade away, but I love that, that we keep on talking. So yeah, yeah having conversations is amazing. It, it really, sometimes you want to hold up, you know, I'm kind of an introvert, but like, it really makes me feel good when I actually do it, you know? And I think it's good to do it and share it because I think people benefit from hearing us talk about our journeys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is a good thing. It's a win, win, win. So anything you want to share final words? No, just thank you for, uh, thank you for meeting with me. And I really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the future and I'm excited about your future and I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Yes. And if we should have to fundraise, we're just going to, you know, get out there and kick butt. And yeah, we'll have get we'll, we we'll need each other as support. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, I'm going to hit in. Don't leave just a second. Thank okay. you so much for being with me, Tasha yeah. Hardy. I love your name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're a character called Tasha Hardy. There is. I, guess, I have a character. You're, <laughs> you're it. You are it. You need to brand and work on that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to hit in and then I'm just going to say goodbye to you off camera.